We're turning this evening to Psalm 139, the psalm that we read together, and the final two verses. Psalm 139, and the final two verses. And our subject this evening is submitting to God's all-seeing eye. Submitting to God's all-seeing eye. Verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, these are words of great sincerity uttered by David, king of Israel, the sweet psalmist, one who even as a young man experienced an intimate relationship with God. He knew God's tenderness. He had come to know God's forgiveness. He understood even there in the Old Testament that salvation was only through the sacrifice of another, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is his sincere prayer. And I want to ask this question as we begin this evening. Do we pray? And do we know for what to pray? We cannot be true Christians unless we pray. Prayer is an expression of faith. If we believe in God, then surely we shall call upon God. We will seek God. We will desire his knowledge, a communion with him, his help and direction and instruction in our life. Prayer is a recognition that God exists. If we are silent when it comes to the business of prayer, then in one sense we show no respect or reverence for our Creator. Prayer is as instinctive to the true Christian as breathing. Our bodies cannot exist and survive without regular breathing, and neither can a Christian truly be said to be alive and genuine if there is no prayer in the soul. Now, Many unbelievers say prayers. They kind of pray. They may, and perhaps we look back, some of us here this evening, to a time when we had no real regard for the Lord, and yet there were times when we prayed, when we were particularly sensitive, when death, perhaps, of another made us concerned. We were in trouble, and we cried out to God. Some have a kind of superstitious conviction that there is a God. They do not truly know him and recognize him, and yet there is that conviction in every human being that there is a God. Have you ever thought, why are there so many religions? Why is it the default conviction of the majority of people that I must worship? It's because our conscience tells us that there is a God. Man doesn't like the God of the Bible. We are guilty and sinful. We hide from the Lord. We move away from him, but we must worship. And so that's why there are many false religions, imaginary gods, which accommodate this deep conviction, inclination, perhaps we should call it, in the human heart to worship something, somebody. Some pray because it makes their conscience a little easier. But their prayers are hollow. There's little that is in that is sincere. It is a box that is ticked. It is a duty that is performed. We're not speaking this evening about such forms of prayer. 
For what do we pray? That will search how genuine our Christianity is because the converted person prays primarily for spiritual things. And what I mean by that is the needs of the soul. We pray for faith. We pray for an understanding of God's word. We pray to be right with God, forgiven for our sin. We pray that we shall make progress in overcoming old habits and sinful things and desires. If these things are never get a thought in our prayers, we must question ourselves. So as we come to these verses, they are very helpful to us. They may even prime the pumps of our prayerless heart when we realize that this is the language that if we adopt with all our heart is worthy of our God. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, any way that causes pain or grief, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now this is not the prayer of this ungodly world. And it's not the prayer of an unconverted person. In our ungodliness, we cannot pray and we would not pray, search me, O oh God. An unconverted person is rather like a nocturnal creature. You know the nocturnal creatures, the owls, the bats, the badgers, they come out at night when they can creep around unseen. And so many people, spiritually speaking, they're like that. As soon as the sun is up, they hide away. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They do not want to come under the all-seeing eye of the Almighty. They want to continue to live their lives away from the gaze of the Lord. But David is the very opposite here. He welcomes, he desires the all-seeing eye of God. Perhaps we could just step aside from these verses for a moment. As we read through this psalm, you will see that David stands amazed at the knowledge of the Lord as he reflects Understand, uh, understands, taught no doubt by the Spirit of God, that wherever he is, God can see him, sees his down sitting when he's alone in the privacy of his own home, alone with his thoughts, the Lord knows him in those moments of down sitting, but also his uprising when he is going about the day's business. The Lord sees him and knows him. And he adds that wherever he is, if he ascends to the highest imaginable height, far away from terra firma, if he could get there, the Lord would see him. And if he could bury himself in the lowest depths of the sea, he says, lo, thou art there, and your eye would be upon me. How do we feel about such a God? Is it, does it make us feel uncomfortable? Does it intimidate us? For David, it was something that filled him with gladness and reassurance. Yes, as we see in these final two verses, it was a thought that tempered him with reverence and caution but it caused great delight that he should be under the all-seeing eye of God. But for many people, this is intimidating. The very thought that God sees me, that to, me, to God my thoughts are words, as Matthew Henry said, these things are intimidating. They, un they make me feel uncomfortable. 
but for those who love the Lord, who have found his mercy and forgiveness and salvation. What a tremendous thought that God knows all the detail of my life. He knows my thoughts, though he is afar off. It's a wonderful thought. But come back to this prayer. This is not the prayer that many of us once thought to pray. We were more like the Pharisee in the public, in the parable that we read together. The Pharisee went into the house of God and he congratulated himself that he was better than other men. That he had not done this, he had not done that, but rather he had given tithes of all that he possessed, even the herbs in his garden. And some of us, they used to say there's a little bit of the Pharisee in every one of us by nature. But some of us, it's more than others. But David is not like that here in this psalm, as we shall see. This, firstly then, is the prayer of one who now has a clear and right view of God. Do you have that? How do you view God? It would be a wonderful thing if we all viewed God as this psalmist, David. Look at the language here. Firstly, he says, search me, O God. You know then the Old Testament, there are many names for God. You go back to the previous verse 21. The Lord is addressed as, O Lord. The beginning of the psalm, O Lord, thou hast searched me. But here, in verse 23, King David addresses his creator as, O God. And in the Hebrew, this is El, the great God, the only one who can exhaustively know all things and who knows the deep recesses of my soul, my desires, my attitudes, my affections. Here is David recognizing the unfathomable, all-seeing, all-knowing character of God and coming in submission before him. It's a confession of our need. It's a declaration of our consecration to such a God. Remember Job in the Old Testament at the end of his encounter with the Lord says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Have we seen God? I don't mean with our physical eyes, but have we conceived with the help of God's Spirit the fact that God knows everything, all the detail of our lives. There's not a thought in my head says David earlier in this psalm, but lo, behold, thou knowest it altogether. This is the prayer then of one who knows that there is no hiding place from God. What a starting point. If you and I desire to know the Lord, we desire his pardoning love, and grace, then we must recognize there's no hiding place from our God. Look at verse 23 here. Know my thoughts. The word translated thoughts here, it's only used twice in the scriptures. It's a Hebrew word that means to branch out. And the idea here is those thoughts that branch out from another line of thinking. And it is thought to refer especially to those thoughts that are disturbed thoughts, disquieted, complaining thoughts. 
It's as if David here is conscious that it's when he is most irritated or disturbed or discouraged that he is likely to branch out in the thinking process of his mind with thoughts that would breed sin. Have you ever thought of those things? We can so easily be led to complain, bitterness, resentment toward the Lord, questioning why in his providence he should allow this to happen, why he would not permit that to happen. David is aware of that, and he says, no, my thoughts. Those thoughts when I'm most likely to sin. And he brings them before the Lord. So, firstly, it's the prayer of one who knows there's no hiding from God. Have you come to that recognition? It's a good starting point. I read today a quotation from J.C. Ryle. The old bishop said, the starting point for the road that leads to heaven is to recognize that we are on the road that leads to hell. Have you recognized that? You see yourself now as sinful and guilty, flawed, one who has offended God, who sees you, and you cannot hide from him. That's a great mercy, at least if we recognize that fact. But uh, this is also the prayer of one who recognizes that he is God's creature. Look at verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well or greatly. There's many in this world. They have discovered so many of the complexities and intricacies of the human body, the amazing way in which the various organs function, the mind with its powers of memory and processing that astound even those who are advanced in computer technology. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. The tragedy is many who have that knowledge of the complexity of the human heart, nature and being fail to recognize that we are the handiwork of God, do we? The moment we truly appreciate that God made us, he gave us bodies and minds, faculties, which astound even modern scientists, then we begin to appreciate the God who made the eye, he must see us. The God who made the ear, he must hear us. The God who gave us those powers of reason, he must read our thoughts. Do we have such a view? He recognizes that he is God's creature, but thirdly, he's one that recognizes the purity of God. Look at verse 19. This sometimes, when we read this psalm, seems to be out of place, but it's not. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God, depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. Here is the all-seeing God who doesn't only see the humble-hearted, but he sees all the wickedness of the wicked, those who have rejected him and defied him and profaned his name and trampled upon his laws. He sees these things, but God is holy. And God must punish all sin. David recognizes that. And that in part compels him to express the words of this prayer. But fourthly, these are the words of one who appreciates God's tender care and interest in himself. Look at verse 17. He's spoken of his body formed in the womb growing 
imperceptibly and remarkably. But he adds, verse 17, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. And by that he means God's thoughts towards him. God's purposes of kindness towards him. How great is the sum of them. He reflects upon the goodness of God and the kindness of God and the mercy of God as one whom God has revealed himself to and these things move his heart. It's one thing when we pray, O oh Lord, deliver me from my sin because we fear his holiness and his justice. But the best prayers, and I suggest to you David's prayer here, is a prayer that was prompted not so much by a sense of God's holiness, but by a realization of God's tender care and love. Have you seen that? Can you reflect upon the fact that God has spared your life? That God has promised if you seek him, he will have mercy upon you and guide you and bless you and order your thoughts and your ways and bring you at last to himself. God is good. God is gracious. God is a God of eternal love and purpose. And if we seek him and call upon him and we pray these, the words of this prayer for ourselves, it will move us and it will cause great blessing. So this is the first thing I wanted to explore. This is the prayer of one who now has a right, a clear view of God. How much we need that. So often our tongues fall silent. We never pray because we've never truly grasped the character, the attributes, the all-seeing nature of God himself. The second thing we notice from this psalm and from these verses is that this is not the prayer of a man who thinks himself to be sinless, but rather a man who knows himself to be sincere. We need not be intimidated, or some may say, I'm such a sinful person, my conscience continually accuses me. How can I pray to God? There are so many obvious sins, habitual sins, that continue to plague me. I can't come near this final prayer of David. But David here is not implying that he is without sin. But he is affirming that in his heart he is sincere. And this is the mark of a true Christian. A true Christian is not someone who is now without sin. The Bible makes it clear that even the Apostle Paul, whilst in this life, he was a man who had to battle his old sinful members. His old nature was still alive and kicking. And so it will be with all God's children. Until we come to death and to glory, we will have to resist sin. But the true child of God, though he is not without sin, is sincere. Are you sincere this evening? Can you honestly say that you sincerely are troubled by your guilt, by your continued sinfulness? Are you anxious to forsake your sin? Are you ashamed of your sin? It's one thing to shrug the shoulders and continue in our merry life of sin. It's another thing to say, O oh Lord, I know that I am and in me there is no good thing, but I desire to please thee. That was the desire of David here. Let me try and explain. In the child of God, there is distance between himself and his sin. 
is still part of him, but it's no longer something that he cherishes in his heart. He no longer loves sin. She no longer turns a blind eye to sin and brazenly continues in that old sinful habit. That's the difference. The stream may still be polluted, but the spring has been cleansed. And so it is in the Christian's life, that stream of life, there is still muddied waters. There are still times when our old nature blots our testimony, but the spring of the heart, those deep desires of the heart are now pure. We delight in the law of God. We long to please him. We want to be free from even secret sins. That's why King David says here, know my heart. It's not just cleanse away all those public sins, those sins that I commit before my courtiers and officials and family members. Oh Lord, know my heart. I want to be rid of those sins of motive, those sins of pride, and so on. The ground may still be contaminated with, with weeds, but the weeds, you could say, are no longer growing unchecked. Your heart and mind will still have the seeds of sin, the propensity to sin within, but in the Christian the sincere person, those sins are not left unchecked. As soon as they begin to sprout and they're seen and we're conscious of them, we cry unto the Lord in repentance and we ask for grace that we may mortify those sins. Are you sincere in that sense? You no longer are careless and oblivious when your conscience accuses you? That's the difference. The love of sin is gone. Any sin once known is addressed before God in confession. Well, here is the prayer of sincerity then. And uh, I want to look at some of the detail that we have here. I suggest to you firstly, it's the prayer of one who is anxious to be right with God. If you're seeking the Lord this evening, then surely that's a great burden to us. I want to be right with God. And you know, the more we love God, the more we shall anxious, be anxious to be right with him. When we love someone, we cannot bear that they should be upset or offended at anything that we have said and done. When we love God and we begin to conceive his tenderness and his goodness and his readiness to bless us, we shall say, oh Lord, search me. If there's any sin here, I want it to be addressed. I cannot bear to live knowing that there's anything in my life that is offensive to thee. I want to be free from all sin, not the open sins alone, but those sins that only my God sees. Is there idolatry in my heart, Lord? Are there things that are dearer to me than God himself? They're idols. Are there things that I think about more than I think about God, things that would cause me greater distress if I were to have to forfeit them than to forfeit the love and kindness of God, they're idols. But as William Cowper, the hymn writer, we say, the dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, Lord, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Is it fashion? And clothes, they can be an idol to us, particularly when we're younger. Is it possessions, material things? Might even be friendships. 
They're more important to us than God. They become an idol. But the genuine, sincere believer says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Some suggest that the wicked way here is a habit. Do you have an idolatrous habit? Here is the prayer. It may be a love of the world. Look back to verse 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? This is David pledging his sincerity. But he knows that he cannot be right with God whilst he is in a friendship with the worldly people, those that profane God's name, those that have no reverence for God and his word. Do you love the world? Do you court its admiration? Do you desire worldly friends who take God's name in vain or show no respect to his word? You cannot be sincere. This psalm calls us away from that. But also we see God's, uh, David's sincerity here in that he is one who doesn't trust his own heart. The true converted person doesn't trust their own heart. Jeremiah the prophet said, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And David here says, Lord, you search me. Try my thoughts. Know my heart. You see if there be any wicked way in me. I cannot trust myself. I know that my heart is a deceitful thing. It will conceal sin. It will try and harbor it and cover it up so that I will never know about the sin. You know, when someone becomes an alcoholic, they become deceitful. Even to those that love them best, they'll hide their habit if they can. They'll hide the drink that they want to secretly swig. And that says something really about the character of our own heart. Our hearts don't want the new converted part of us to know that there's sin. And so the heart will pretend, oh, well, you're not as idolatrous as you think you are, or you fear you may be. You're not a proud person. Others may see it. And if we know our own hearts, we shall cry to the Lord and say, oh, Lord, you search me. See if there be any wicked way in me. But then look towards the end of these two verses. Here is the prayer of sincerity further. Lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in the way everlasting. What does that mean here? Well, some suggest it means something like this. Lead me in the good old way and keep me until I reach the end. That good old way that leads to life everlasting. It's the way of Jesus Christ, the Savior. In the Old Testament, before Christ had come into this world and had lived his perfect life and offered himself a sacrifice for sin, Christ was revealed in shadows, in pictures, in prophecies. Men like King David here understood that the way everlasting was the way of Christ, God's promised anointed one. He must come. David knew when he went into the tabernacle, if he would be right with God, then he had to bring the sacrificial lamb or bullock. The animal had to be slain as a substitute. His own guilt and sin needed to be imputed, put upon that animal, as it were, and that animal would lose its life in David's place. 
he would understand that this was God's method. This was God's way to everlasting life. He glimpsed it. He understood it. He trusted God's plan of redemption. We look back. We have the advantage of greater clarity because Christ has come. He's lived, he's died, he's risen again. He has undertook all that was necessary to pay the price of sin. We trust in him. We understand we cannot save ourselves, but we plead the merits of Jesus Christ. Others suggest that this phrase here emphasizes something slightly more. I have come to see the door, the gate, that leads to the way of life. But that's not enough for me. O oh Lord, lead me and keep me in that everlasting pathway until I reach the end. Perhaps that is more in David's mind. I want to be brought to the very end. It's no use seeing Christ, seeing him as the gate, the door into the way of forgiveness. We need to be brought to walk in that way, in obedience to God, trusting in the sacrifice of Christ, submitting to him who alone is worthy to be our Lord and Master. Is that our prayer? This is the prayer of someone who is sincere. We don't trust our own heart. We know something of the plague of sin within, but we want to be free of it. When this psalm began, and with this I close, we see here verse 1. Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting mine uprising, thou understandest my thought afar off. That was the reality. David recognized it. But he closes this psalm with similar language, and yet there is a subtle difference. Search me, O God, and know my heart. David here now submits to the reality. He welcomes that search. He wants the Lord not only to search him, but to reveal to him any defect in his life, any sinful tendency, any thought that is amiss, that he may confess it, that he may renounce it, and follow in the path of righteousness. There's the language that makes the difference between someone who is not a Christian and someone who is. Would you pray this prayer? Would you say, O oh Lord, I recognize that thou art the God that sees and knows me just as I am, but I welcome thy all-seeing eye, not because I am free from sin, but because I desire to know the worst of my sinful heart, that I may confess my sin, renounce it, and seek forgiveness for all that is wrong through Jesus Christ, who is that everlasting way to life, to peace, and to communion with the only true and living God. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, we thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for the sentiments of this remarkable prayer. We know that in our natural condition, we would fear the all-seeing and searching eye of a holy God. Give us the heart of King David, that we may be like him, and that we may not shy away from the reality of our sinful nature, but seek to be cleansed from it, and that every sin, even the smallest, most secret of our sins, may be brought to our own notice, that we may for seek forgiveness for them and be led in that way everlasting. Watch over us now. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Amen. We close our worship with hymn 417.